There was no need for them. There was no necessity for them. No application had been identified for which they were necessary. Compare that with today. We can be quite certain that someone, somewhere, has found it necessary to use a, com a computer to slice bread. When my wife, who's been kind enough to escort me to this meeting today, wanted to make that drawing, she found it necessary to go to the primary school in our village and get the six-year-old children to show her how to make it on their computers. <laughs> now, it's possible that Morris Wing Wilkes could be the exception to this rule. He's told me that when EDSAC was first uh, brought into use, there were a substantial number of research projects waiting to be run on it. But I found four pieces of information, four pieces of evidence to support that assertion. The first comes from Harry Johnson, who is several of us will know. In the, he's very fortunate in having a most remarkable memory. And he's also uh, gifted in getting a really clear understanding of any particular situation. Fortunately, he's still alive, but he's not with us today. Now, uh, he told me that in the, uh, in, the late, in, the, in the early 1950s, when he was working in the Ministry of Civil Aviation, and he found that he needed some substantial computing facilities, he had no difficulty at all in finding them. That is to say, there was an adequate supply of people using hand calculation and run speakers and things like that. A second bit of evidence is that when Harry Johnson was seconded to the NPL in the very early days of the pilot ace, He gathered that in the atmosphere at the NPL, there was an idea that a single national computer should be established for Britain. One. I don't think there was, you know, you. Well, <laughs> I'm reporting what Harry, what Harry Johnson has told me. That's all I can do. Well, he came and used the Houston. High place and NPL. And yeah, I, I know you were. Really George Davis will be happy to contradict me during the <laughs> discussion period. <laughs> the third piece of information, evidence I got, is that he found that Wilkinson at the NPL uh, uh, had where there was a very substantial mathematics department, was having quite some difficulty in finding suitable applications to test out the pilot ace. The fourth piece of, the fourth piece of evidence comes from Bernard Swan's history of the computer department. This has not been generally published, but a number of us have copies of it. An extraordinarily valuable record of early, I should have said the frantic computer problem. Extraordinarily valuable 
record of the early work there. Now he records that he had a conversation with Hartree, who certainly was fully aware of all the mathematical work going on at Cambridge University. And Hartree gave the opinion that uh, there would be no need for more than the three computers which had already been started, uh, one at NPL, one at Cambridge, and one at Manchester. And he threw in another one for Scotland for national pride. Now the only implication of those four bits of, ev of evidence is that at that time people had not established any necessity for using computers. However, for some of us in Ferranti, the boot was on the other foot. You'll recall that when the Manchester computer pioneers had made their large machine, they walked along the road to Ferranti, the electrical engineering firm, and asked them to make a well-engineered uh, uh, version of it. This became the first, uh, we called it Mark I, Ferranti machine installed at Manchester University. Lockspizer authorized that development. He gave uh, Ferranti a blank check, therefore starting the government practice of mounting all computer projects with blank check. We've got one for the National Health Service now. The check's been made out for six billion pounds. It's already going to cost 30 billion pounds. It's your money, it's my money, that makes up the shortfall. Now, that project which was given to Franti was a one-off development project. But Sir Vincent Franti was the most remarkable person and he had the insight or vision to realize that there was a possibility of manufacturing electronic computers and making a business out of them. He seems to have been the first person, at least in Europe, to have that vision. He engaged Vivian Bowden as one of his first uh, uh, tasks. Now, Vivian Burden was a most remarkable man. He had a brilliant intellect. His thinking went on the, followed the practice of what we nowadays call lateral thinking. He would be thinking at one particular objective and he would bring in other strands of thought uh, laterally. He was highly creative, extraordinarily creative, and perhaps most of all, he was astoundingly persuasive. And Bowden soon realized the necessity to invent uses for computers. He was probably the first man to be aware that these uses had to be invented. Now when I joined Ferranti in 1953, September 1953, there were five of us, five or six of us, for whom it was necessary to invent the applications for these early computers.
Now let's focus on the time scale that I'm talking about. You're all familiar with the matters on this chart because they're the, it's an attempt to show the timetable of the early machines. I make no bones at all about asserting that the Manchester Baby computer was the invention or represented the invention of computers. George Davis shakes his head. I'm talking about stored program electronic digital computers. I don't count EXAC or Colossus or anything like that as being what we're interested in. And this was the Manchester Baby, which uh, has been, a replica of it, has been uh, constructed in one of the Manchester museums. And we have the date for that fairly accurately, very accurately. And many of us will have been to the great reunion celebration which was held in Manchester in uh, 1998. That machine first ran in June 1948. Now I may say that while this chart is very familiar to us, it was really quite difficult to establish this information. And I hope others uh, will be prepared to correct me for various errors that may be in it. But please don't do it shouting out loud for everyone to hear. Come and talk to me quietly about it afterwards. <laughs> now, in, in 1949, we got to the stage where EDSAC was operational in Manchester. Uh, and in Cambridge. 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 I'm sorry, in Cambridge. Yes, EDSAC in Cambridge, uh, done primarily by Wilkes and Rennie. And also in that year, the large Manchester machine became operational. In 1950, the pilot ACE was operational at the NPL. By 1951, the first Ferranti engineered version of the Manchester machine was operational and Leo 1 became operational. Now apparently it was in 1952 that the pilot ACE became operational as a general computing service. And it's a little bit interesting to note that it went, it's, there's a gap between 1950 and 1952 while that machine was being gradually worked up into practical operating condition. By 1953, the improved Manchester Mark I Star had become operational. We know that in April, the Elliott 401 operated at the Physical Society exhibition for the first time. And in December, Leo 1 became operational for service. So on through 1954, uh, 1955, now I may well have got this wrong, you may need to correct me about this, because I'm not very familiar with the English electric computers. Apparently, uh, the Deuce became operational in 1955. In 1956, Pegasus became operational for a computing service. 
We know that date for certain because it's in one of my pocket diaries. In 1957, we got a Franti Mercury computer operational in Norway. It looks as though Leo II was delivered in that year, and I've had a guess about the full-size ACE of the NPL. Now, the point about this is that that is the first decade of computers. And that's the period I'm interested in, and which I'm going to talk about. Now, looking through my papers for this uh, meeting, I found that I started to take an interest in the early applications of computers in the year 2000, five years ago. And uh, on, on and off, I've been doing this, particularly uh, uh, getting information from my friends. Now, there were two reasons for my taking an interest in this. The first was, the first is, that when I was in Ferranti, I learned, like the rest of us, that whenever you have a particular job on hand, the most important thing to do is to tackle the most difficult part of it. If you identify and manage to cope with the most difficult part, everything else is easy. It's a very valuable thing that I learned, and I apply it all sorts of ways. Now, later on, I found that the earliest stage in any historical inquiry is the most difficult. This is primarily because so little is recorded at the beginning of any uh, uh, um, project. So let's look now at the documentation which is available for early applications. Please keep this time, the time scale, in mind all the way through, starting in the middle of 1948. It was not until sometime in 1951 that apparently the first documents on applications were published. These were two papers by uh, John Bennett and one on X-ray crystallography, projects done at EXAC, and Morris Wilkes told me that the Bennett's papers were published in the Proceedings of the Royal Society. If any of you can find them there, it would be very helpful. Now, by 1952, Vivian Bowden, in the second half of 1952, Vivian Bowden, was writing his book, Faster Than Thought. You'll be familiar with this, I hope. <coughs> Where are we? You can write on it. There we are. Faster Than Thought. Written in the second half of 1952. About 15 or so people collaborated with Burden in writing it, but it was his concept, and you've got to realize that these 15 people were very busy indeed. He had to persuade them to lay down their work and pick up a pen and write contributions for this. Now this book contains a very large section on applications, and I've marked it for you there. That green block is the section of the book on computer applications as known in the second half of 1952. 
It's about a third of the book. Now it turns out, if you read those chapters carefully, that with one or two exceptions, they were not real applications. Vivian Burden was very clever. Remember I told you? He very seldom uses the present tense. It's almost always the future tense. His sentences are qualified by might be, could be, thought to be possible. A third of the book is filled up with non-existent applications. And that was the best he could do in 1952. Now, at some later date, I don't know where it is, but there were two papers. They, these are in the Science Museum. I found these in the Science Museum. Uh, Bowden published a paper on use of computers in aircraft design. And Bernard Swan uh, published one on use of computers for industrial and commercial applications. I, I don't know the dates of those, but I guess that they were done in 1953. Now, in, 1950, in 1955, I gave a lecture on the uh, applications of computers. I still have a copy of it in my files. It got published subsequently. Now there are three things which are rather odd about this paper. The first is that when I wanted to show a photograph of Pegasus. There it is. It's an artist's drawing. That means that in July 1950, no, this is published a bit later, September 1955, we could not take a photograph of Pegasus. My recollection is that the doors had not been fitted to the cabinets, so I had to fall back on an artist's impression. There are about a dozen types of application described in this uh, article. And my recollection is that except for Burden's book, this was the first time any attempt had been made to publicize a range of computer applications. But the title of it, is future applications of computers. Future applications of digital computers. I was copying Bowman's trick. And except for the section on aircraft calculations, everything else is not in the present tense. They're all in the future tense. They're all saying could be, might be, just thought that. So it means that by the middle of 1955, there was a most remarkable paucity of established applications. Now we go on. 1956. I started in Ferranti a series of documents which he called the CS series. This is an early example of one. You see, very uh, rudimentary presentation. It had text and diagrams. And many of you will be very familiar with some of those diagrams, won't you? Dear old punch cards. This was a, a document on punch card 
uh, printing on punch cards as we used them in fancy computers. Now, I think I started that series in the middle of um, uh, the started it in 1956, just after he got Pegasus working. And the third of these documents were to do with equipment, which we now doubt for hardware. A third of them were to do with programs, program library and so on, which we call software. And a third were to do with applications. Over eight years, we published 400 of these. So we were running at the rate of five a week. Fifty. I'm sorry, I've got my list of wrong. Anyhow, you, you're all very good at uh, mathematicians. You can work out. For 400 copies in five years, in eight years. It was a very high rate of striking. Now, I have a habit which my wife finds very troublesome indeed, of collecting things because they might be useful at some time in the future. And I started collecting these things. And in 1979, I gave my collection of these Sears documents right from the very beginning. The whole point of making a collection is that you start at the beginning. And it's very difficult indeed to know when that beginning is. That's always the trouble. In 1979, I gave these to the Science Museum. And they're lost. Please stop. Please stop. They've been found. They've been found, have they? <laughs> hooray! 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 Now, that, that, lets you, that lets you off the hook. Because I was going to say that I've asked the committee of our society uh, to set up a search party <laughs> to find these things they were down in the basement somewhere and uh, the committee didn't at that time for two years they took no notes of it I was going to enroll some of you to make a search party in the basement but it looks as though it's unnecessary that's terrific I sent them to the library in a um, carton as wide as this now New Zealand apples I was going to suggest we should go into the basement and look for some New Zealand apples. Anyhow, that, that, that seems to be honest. Now Hunt, in that year, wrote an article on aircraft structural analysis. And also at the end of that year, Harry Cotton, colleague in Manchester, wrote uh, wrote uh, another document, Applications of Frantic Computers. And this is a photocopy of it. And it has about 25 applications in it. It's beautifully produced. The articles are very authoritative. And at the, every, at the end of every one, he said that this application was done on the Manchester University computer, the Mark I computer, in 10 minutes, whereas it had taken three and a half weeks to do it by hand. What he is re revealing there is that for all those applications, computers were unnecessary. All those applications had already been done by hand. That was the state of play in 1956. In 1957, Berners-Lee published an article on machine loading. Very, un very unusual and interesting application of computers. And in October, Peter Young published a paper on electrical planning. And in December, uh, Cyril Gradwell from Manchester, Frantic, published an article in Overseas Engineer. This was another review of applications. Very competent, very good. Now, Peter Young was my assistant, 
and therefore probably I prompted him to do that one on electrical planning. And of course, Conway Berners-Lee was one of my colleagues. We worked closely in adjacent offices. But look at Bradwell's article, published in the Overseas Engineer. By 1957, six years after computers had been invented, it was impossible to get a British editor of any journal to accept an article on the applications of computers. They just weren't interested. So he had to go to a, a journal, not to British engineers, but overseas engineers. And this was one of the very great difficulties in these days of publishing work on the application of the computers. You could not find a place to take the article. We could write the articles, but we could not get them published. Because, of course, the editors were reflecting the interest of their readers. Readers were not interested in the applications of computers. Now let's look at the timetable of some key applications. Same scale starts in 1948 and it looks as though in 1951 Bennett and Kendrew uh, from Cambridge were publishing, uh, had established, I'm not talking about publishing now, had established a practical use for computers in X-ray crystallography. The next item is map surveying. In those days there were no satellites. The way you did surveying was by means of a theodolite and a chain measuring length. And you took two fixed two known places on a map and using theodolite and the chain you measured you took readings from those to other items that you were interested in you gradually made a series of measurements which were called a traverse and the whole skill cunning was that you made this chain this link this, uh, this sequence of measurements round back to your starting point. But of course when you got back to the starting point, it didn't agree. Figures didn't agree. It was always a mismatch. And it was a substantial mathematical dodge task, substantial mathematical task, to juggle the figures, to correct that error, and to apportion corrections around all the measurements. And it's a non, it's not a, it's a, it's a non insignificant mathematical task because I think there are cosines. If the ground's not level, I think there are cosines involved. Now, when Harry Johnson went to NPL, one of the first jobs he was given, which was apparently a real job, was to put a series of map surveying data into the pilot ace. And uh, he found a math with, with Wilkinson. He found a way of doing this. It was not at all easy because the pilot ace and he had 320 words of storm. But because his matrices had a lot of zeros, he was able to do it. He had a pack of cards, he ran them through the machine again and again and again. So by 1952, we seem to have got to a real application. Also in that year, at Manchester, the French people were asked to help 
in the uh, calculations involved with what's called the ballooning of a thread when it's being spun. What happens is that on a, on a spinning machine, uh, the, the threads, comb threads, are fed in at the top. A machine twists them round and round, and they come out as a twisted thread at the bottom. Now, between where the threads fed in and where it comes out, the thread form it doesn't go straight down, it balloons out. In actual fact, when you look at it, it looks like a figure of eight. And the Manchester, the frantic people of Manchester were asked to do this as a real application. And this is one of the applications in Bowden's book, which is written in the present tense. It looks as if in 1952, uh, Glenny was probably beginning to do calculations on a computer for the trajectories of shells. This is a ballistic calculation. It's quite difficult. It involves some partial differential equations and that kind of thing. Um, probably he was doing it. Uh, two, two of the early frantic computers went into the military and uh, we heard very, very little about what they were used for. But one can assume that by 1952, uh, Glenny had done some work on uh, the, the ballistics of a shell. By 1953, probably there were some real applications related to guided weapons. Before that, the year or so before that, I'd been involved in making an analog computer. George Felton and I made an analog computer for the analysis of guided weapons experiments. And one must assume that by 1953, the military were beginning to do real applications on that subject. In 1954, Christopher Strachey went over to America and did a real application on the flow of water in the St. Lawrence uh, River Seaway. Uh, they were altering, they were making a canal or something like that for the St. Lawrence River, and they had to make sure that the flow of water past the islands was okay. And Christopher Strachey uh, did that job in 1954. Uh, in 1954 or so, the, one of the first aircraft projects was done. This is called Flutter. I'll explain it very briefly. If you have a mass carried on a spring and you disturb its position, it oscillates at a particular frequency. An aeroplane is made up of a large number of masses, all fixed together by springs. We think of an aeroplane as being rigid, but it most certainly isn't. It's a very flexible thing. Peter Hunt, who was working at de Havilland, came to Elliot Brothers and asked if this problem, which had been tackled theoretically by Wilkinson at um, NPL, uh, asked whether uh, we would help, whether the Elliot people, Elliot Brothers people at Borenwood, whether they would help him do this calculation for the comet. All, the only computer that Elliot Brothers had then was Nicholas, <coughs> which was a, a very much a prototype. It preceded the 401. And Ruth Felton, who can't be with us today because she's got a flu or something, or sore throat, 
wrote the input routine for this project, and George Felton had written a matrix manipulation program. So the two Feltons and Peter Hunt carried out the flutter calculation for the comet. Peter Hunt had to idealize the comet aircraft into ten masses. This is because it involved matrices of order 10, and Nicholas only had a thousand words for store and data. One wonders why he didn't go to NPL, but perhaps they only had 320 words. I don't know what they had in 1954. Anyhow, the three of them solved this problem for, for the comet. And George Felton has told me that he several times flew in the comet and was very thankful that he knew that the plane would not fall to bits. I should say, the danger with the flutter problem is that if they, due to the flexing, due to all the flexibility in that, if due to the flexing, the aerodynamic loads get modified, then you get a forced vibration and of course it builds up. And it was one of the dangers of being a test pilot before computers were designed, that every now and again the tail would fall off. Well, George knew that the tail wouldn't fall off the comet. What he did not know was that aluminum alloys exhibit a fatigue effect. And luckily, because he's still with us, he was not flying in the two comets which blew up in the air. Anyhow, they didn't fail because of flutter, and probably because of what Peter Hunt and George Walton did. Our third application, which was done in 1954, was the scheduling of bus services, which was done by Conley Berners-Lee. No, he says not. No, Mary Lee Berners-Lee, his yeah. wife. Who so helped. Yes. People who did it were not in trouble. Yeah, yeah. At any rate, the Berners-Lee family was involved in this. <laughs> and this is a topical interest to us, because it was a number 11 bus service which runs from Shepherd's Bush, past the other side, along Bayswater Road, the other side of Hyde Park, and goes to Liverpool Street, and turns around and comes back again. Now this is quite a difficult thing to tackle because the assumption is that people will come to uh, bus stops in a random order and if the bus gets a little bit late, the number of people getting on and off uh, grown up, the bus gets delayed and you've obviously got an unstable situation. And somebody in London Passenger Transport wanted to simulate this effect on a computer. And Conway berners -Lee still has the report of this. He's shown it to me. Anyhow, it was a real job. I think in 1955, the Shell people were <coughs> beginning to do the optimization of tankers and their loads. They had a very big tanker fleet. They wanted to know which tanker to put on which road and what load had to have in it. And I think that it was probably in 1955 that they started doing that. A real job. And also in 1955, uh, 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 Dr. Black started doing optimization of lens design. So those uh, seem to be the most critical early applications. And I think one could say that computers were necessary for them. Now, let's look at uh, make a kind of survey of uh, early applications. 
these first five seem to have all been done at EDSAC, on EDSAC in Cambridge. John Bennett and I were both Cambridge engineers and uh, applied maths is, looms very large in our training and I have the feeling that those subjects of stresses and the stability and distribution of power were very characteristic applied mathematics problems which a Cambridge engineer would put his hand to. I'm not really certain that they were taken up by the CGB or that the CGB took any notice of his work. Oh yes, uh, it seems that in the guided weapons work, those calculations done on uh, a guided weapon which was st steered itself onto a moving target. That seems to have been something that they did probably in 1953. Now in 1953, uh, Johnson, Harry Johnson, was beginning to do operational research on the behavior of cues. And I remember him telling me that the problem about designing an airport is that all the people who walk about in airports walk about in queues. So there's no steady flow. It's always a bunch of people. And it's quite difficult to design an airport for that reason. And he was working out the calculations for it. So there's the Berners Lee's, or Mary Berners Lee's bus service. And these we've talked about already. Now I forgot to tell you that in 1952, Vivian Bowden persuaded the Society of British Aircraft Constructors to set up a panel to uh, consider the applications of computers to aircraft structural design. Uh, Bowden, well, uh, of course, he founded and set up this committee. It was his idea, his persuasion. And he attended it to begin with, and then I followed on, and I used to attend it as well. And that was when I first began to meet uh, our colleagues from the NPL, Wilkinson and Woodger, and the people from English Electric. They, uh, English Electric was working very closely with NPL. And that's when I made friends with all these people. And. Uh, we established a significant number of aircraft calculations. Very soon after that, we established a set of programs for doing stress calculations in frameworks, rigid frameworks. It's quite easy to do stress calculations. I mean, I could do it when I was at college, where the members of the framework are pin jointed. But where you've got solid joints, the stressing is much more complicated. And it really was necessary to use computers for that. And we extended it for the stressing of pipe systems, where you've got temperature and pressure uh, um, uh, problems. Now, let's just expand a little more on this surveying matter. When Pegasus the design of Pegasus had been done, and the technique of using the logical packages which Bill Elliott and Charles Owen devised had been established. John Bennett, particularly, got interested in starting to design special purpose computers, and he chose this map, map surveying problem as an example. And he designed on paper. I should say, when Pegasus was designed, it was called FPC-1, Frantic Pegasus, Frantic Package Computer Number 1. He designed FPC-2. This was done specifically for the Ordnance Survey, specifically 
for this backdrop. And he's recorded how when he designed this, he got uh, a big brass from the Ordnance Survey. Remember, they're military. And this chap came with his cap and all his pips on his shoulders. And John Bennett took him up to Manchester to impress this guy on how wonderful computers were. All he got was a Manchester machine. And that day it didn't work at all. So this big brass went back then to Southampton or wherever it was, and they never bought a computer. And that FPC2 project died. Now also, in about that year, I may have got my bit of something wrong here. Harry Johnson got the idea that a computer could be used as a, to help air traffic controllers. And he designed on paper a special purpose computer uh, which would do this. Uh, in fact, the job dragged on for years and years and years. And in the end, it was implemented in a transistorized machine uh, which we called Apollo. And this one, after trials, went into service at Prestwick Airport as an aid to the air traffic controllers, and it ran for over 21 years, which is a very remarkable achievement for a very early transistorized computer. Now, this subject of optical lens design seems to have gone through three phases. It was a very early calculation done on the pilot ace and other machines in the form of ray tracing. And uh, that seems to have been done in 1951. By 1955, uh, Black was suggesting, or perhaps even using, a uh, computer to do automatic design of lenses. And I was very interested in this subject, and I took it up for a frantic. And by 1956, my pocket diary shows that another man um, had done the first ray tracing through a zoom lens. So it's quite an interesting subject because it went through three phases. And I just want to show you this. This is a diagram from Black's paper of tracing a ray through a high performance lens. Uh, he worked for Taylor Taylor and Hobson, and almost certainly that's a, uh, a, a photographic lens, camera lens for aerial surveying, very high performance. And you'll see that it's a symmetrical lens, and you can see how the path of light goes through. But in the other half of the picture is a diagram of a modern zoom lens. This is of one of the cheapest Leica cameras. And uh, what I'm particularly interested in is a very strange collection of lens components they've got and the fact that uh, in its wide angle position the rays of light are shown coming in here and going out at a very extreme angle. So I think those two pictures show an interesting contrast between where we were in 1955, it was top one 1955, and this will be about 2003. And there's no question at all that this type of zoom lens could only be designed with a, um, with a computer. Hugh, may I suggest so, if you come to the end of a particular topic, yeah. would this be a convenient point to break? Yeah. 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 Yes, I know. I just let this. I know I'm running over a bit. I'm, so, I'm sorry.
Here are some other applications I'll look at them quickly. Uh, experimental statistics, wages calculations. We did a trial on that in 1955. Uh, this one here, uh, this one here, optimization of refinery products, is point of interest here. Uh, BP asked us to provide them with a computer like the one at Shell. But they said, don't for goodness sake tell Shell that we're asking for it. In fact, they got it. And by optimizing the output of a um, refinery, they could save as much money in a year as it cost them to buy the computer. Uh, Berners-Lee did another interesting one here, uh, planning the production of items from a variety of components. For instance, a, uh, an animal feed out of it. And another interesting one I want to just refer to very briefly introduce is that in 1960, just a bit after our decade, uh, Berners-Lee with Samet uh, did a Volta technique for doing text editing and automatic hyphenation for metal type setting. Now, I've also included here what I regard as two rather important items. I, I'll tell you why I call them important. First is by 1958, uh, they're important because I wrote them. <laughs> An estimated 400 new programs are being written each year. By 1960, I could write, Pegasus is a familiar tool of over a thousand programmers. <coughs> I remember being very careful to get, make sure that those statements were true. So here we are in 2005, where someone needs to slice bread and use a computer. And my wife needs to make a drawing and gets the kitty winks at the primary school to help her. And I hope I've shown you that 50 years ago there was a necessity to invent uses for these useless machines <coughs> and a necessity to invent ways to make these useless machines useful. And some of us did that invention. Thank you. Well, I'm quite glad it isn't half full because it would have been cruel to be talking about tea at tea time when you would have all been sitting there salivating, but half three, hopefully you're not quite so bad. Now I'm standing here obviously not as a pioneer, um, but I am somebody who, uh, at university in the 70s, at UCL, did use punched cards, and I did use an IBM 360, so I'm sort of a mini pioneer. And I did work at, I'm trying to get the name right, Marconi Elliott Aviation in the late 70s at Boreham Woods, so I have a, a tiny connection. I worked on, on radar, computer simulation of radar there. So, uh, again, I'm a, a mini, mini, very mini pioneer. But today, it's my delight to talk about Leo, um, a very British company, as are many of the others we've talked about today, and um, tea. Now, I was put onto this by Mike Williams. Um, some of you might know the Canadian Mike Williams, who's written an excellent book on um, the history of computing. And he mentions Leo, and he mentions tea. And I was reading this because uh, Dr. Anderson, David Anderson and I teach the history of computing at Portsmouth, and I read this about tea, and I was fascinated. I thought I have to find out more about it, so um, I went to interview Frank um, about four years ago, and then I went to interview David Kamler, and then I've done various bits of research. I haven't finished writing this up yet. Um, I, I really will do that, but um, you can see what I've found so far. Whoever it was that intro introduced me said, is this really about tea? This tea program here that I'm going to tell you about 
has been neglected. I have no idea why. Um, there's lots about it. Um, maybe we can find out why. I've no idea. I'm going to look very briefly at Lyons' history very, very quickly, because many of you will know it well. But I just want to pick out the points where T appears, just to show you how important T was to Lyons. Then we all know the story of how Leo was introduced, but there's one or two important things I want to draw out about innovation um, and exactly why, in kind of computing terms, they wanted to use Leo. Then Lyons T, and then we'll look at L4, the T blending program. So we've looked at the payroll, um, or people have looked at the payroll program for Leo. Um, I've heard talks here about it. But the T-Blending program, with its innovative decision support, has been neglected. Very, very quickly, um, Lions was started in 1872, and the name that's of interest to us here is not the Gluckstein's, but it's Barnett Salmon. He was a son-in-law in the business, and it's the Salmons. It was a family business. That's what I want to draw out from this. Um, and it's the Salmons that run through. And when we come to the uh, the tea part, um, you'll find it's the Salmons who were instrumental in computerising this. In 1875, uh, Montague Gluckstein went to exhibitions because their tobacco industry, was their tobacco uh, company, was doing badly due to American competition. So he decided to go into exhibitions. They didn't want to compromise their name, so uh, they used the name of um, Joseph Lyons, uh, Montague's brother's wife, um, wife Rose's husband. And Joseph had experience of running a market stall in Manchester. Now, as a Manchester last myself, um, I've been to those market stalls, so bit of my history there. Lyons was made chairman for life, and these are some of the exhibitions that Lyons catered for. Huge exhibitions. And what's important here is the scale. This is very, very large scale. It was Lyons who actually introduced the threepenny pot of tea and a Hungarian band. So when next you go to um, a fair and there's a band there, you think of, of Lyons, so learning a lot today. And a shooting gallery. Who would have thought? Um, by 1894, it became a registered company. And important for us, the new premises at Cadby Hall. Uh, were purchased, well, they moved into whatever, um, and the first tea shop opened in Piccadilly. By 1896 we've got the Trocadero restaurant opened, and corner houses appearing in uh, 1909. 1903 were the first tea and coffee production statistics. Um, I must say that a lot of my information I've got from um, Peter Bird's book, as well as the interview with Frank, and uh, I'll mention other places as I arrive at them. Lions was so prestigious that by 1919 they were serving the royal garden parties. Now, some of you might have come across in, um, in supermarkets today, you might have come across the Lions product, the, the Lions brand, out <coughs> again. Somebody's bought up, you know, someone's bought up the brand, and the quality is so low and it's heartbreaking when you think of what it was. So from 1918 to 45, Lyons was an extremely successful company and full of innovation like their ice cream plant. Key innovations were advanced automatic machinery and top quality goods in vast quantities. So um, it's the controlling the multitude that's important here. It was self-sufficient where possible. Now, a few years ago we found, um, no, last year it was, we found a jingle of the nippy, the sweet, neat nippy, and we can't find it again. So if anybody has the sweet, neat nippy jingle, imagine it playing now. Um, it was vibrant, a company, forward-looking, with a high reputation, but run by this family concern. Now this is where we get onto the computing side and the management information side. They were very concerned, or Simmons was very concerned. I missed a slide. How do I go back? 
No, I haven't missed a slide. Right. Simmons, um, to talk about him in a minute, um, worked for Lyons and was very, very concerned to provide management with better information because with these huge numbers of operations all over there, the company, there was a massive clerical burden. A multitude of small transactions. Now, interestingly, I'm, um, I'm researching into data warehousing. I don't know if any of you are, uh, keep up to date with that kind of thing. But Walmart <coughs> in America were one of the first people to go into data warehousing because they had to control their multitudes of small transactions. And I have a paper in mind on the comparison between the two. Now, Lyons was the first company to recruit <coughs> graduate trainees, and I've only just noticed I should have had this slide introducing Simmons a little bit earlier, mind. Simmons was a top Cambridge mathematician. Now, there are many mathematicians that we know and love who can't tie their own shoelaces. They are not well organized. Fortunately for us, Simmons was not one of these. He was a highly organized person. He transformed office management, breaking jobs down into their functional parts, very important, set up a research section of organization and methods, um, developed the Institute of Administrative Management, and Lyons came to be recognized as a center of excellence in terms of office systems and management. Now these are all very important to, to L4 as I'll show. You all know the story of Simmons visiting America to find out about office machinery and um, Thompson and Stanlingford to find out about the electronic brain. But they found that the um, American office management was inferior to Britain, and it was Stanlingford's idea to use computers. And again, the self-sufficiency, that, that lovely uh, um, British quality there, Lyons determined to build its own computer against all odds. And here's a remark from Kamala. Technically, Lyons was a remarkably comprehensive and self-reliant organization that had a long experience of recognizing way out ideas and carrying them through to timely fruition. In May 1949, the decision was taken to build at Leo. And here's John Pinkerton, many of you will know. Again, David Kamala, um, who spoke not long ago on payroll, um, writing the specifications, and he actually wrote the T specification that we're going to talk about, I believe. Um, it still amazes me that programs were being written and tested whilst Leo was being built. Why have we forgotten these skills? I do not know. So, the importance, one of the important things about Leo was that it integrated tests, uh, tasks previously carried out separately. So the chronology here, we've got L1, we've got our full-scale bakery evaluation job running, L2 in uh, October 54, the tea shops distribution, so this is um, making sure all the tea shops have got their uh, tea, coffee, cakes, uh, etc. And then by October 1954, we've got the draft specification for the tea blending job, which was running by um, 1956. Now, there's much written about L1, L2, and L3, but L4, very little indeed. It's just a passing reference. I love this um, quotation from When Lions Roared. It was the British thirst for a constant supply of tea and cakes that gave the world its first business computer. Um, <laughs> We Brits have um, a reputation for being slightly eccentric, and um, many other Europeans love us for it, and it's certainly one that endears me to Britain. So, let's look at uh, Lyon's use of tea briefly. In 1895, they sold a brand of tea called the Maharaja brand, but the actual tea that you got in the tea shop, they didn't sell, they wouldn't sell that. I'm not quite sure why, but they wouldn't. We've got statistics for their factory output. By 1904, they'd developed a tea resales department. And then in 1905, they've got a tea agents and van system going around the country and selling tea from a van. And um, I've got these pictures from, um, from Peter Bird's book, again, uh, 
beautifully illustrated uh, book. Cash on delivery and maximum profit of tuppence a pound for retail shops. So again, it's these small profits. Now, in the First World War, um, there were tea shortages, and this loss, uh, led to a loss of market share in the north of England, which was dom dominated by Brook Bond. Lyons production fell by 30, 36%, a uh, national average of 15%. Now, there was a, an offer to take over Brook Bond or merge with Brook Bond. Now, the, um, the information I've got here is a very, um, very long <coughs> article I found, handwritten by a Canadian called Hollier, who worked for Lyons, um, and it's in the London Metropolitan Archives, so I, that's where I've got this from, and some of this from Peter Bird. So they could have merged with Brook Bond, but they decided not to, and um, this is a point at which we'll look back and say maybe they should have done. 1918, they acquired an interest in Horniman's, and Black, they took over Black and Green's tea in Manchester, so they've got a, a, good, a good northern uh, representation here. From 1900 to 1920, Harry Salmon uh, was responsible for the tea business. And again, it was the high standards that is very important here. Lions would only have the best, it would only do the best. Um, Green Label was the favourite. Uh, as a keen narrowboater, I love this picture with the, the narrowboat, the train, and the, uh, and the lorries. 1921, the Greenford factory opened. And by the 1925, a huge, um, a huge output of tea, a rise of nearly 8,000%. 1926, the Lugieri Tea Estate was bought in Malawi. Now, my daughter is on a, um, a gap year, and she's actually in Malawi at the moment, so hopefully not being eaten by some tiger. Um, but I wonder if the, uh, what's happened to the Lugieri Tea Estate. Um, the factory was finished in 1929. Mm -hmm. Of course, Peter Bird worked on tea as well. That's uh, another um, link. I don't know, has Peter ever spoken here? Peter Bird? I no? don't think so. Don't think so, right. right. Um, in the 1930s, competitors used inferior blend, blends to undercut lines, and they refused to reduce the cost of green label tea. Again, pride in their standards. Um, Brook Bond and Tai Fu introduced quick infusion teas from smaller leaf tea, but Lyons ignored this innovation. Instead, they promoted their red label, which they felt was a very good label, but it didn't achieve high sales, unfortunately. In 1935, Brook Bond dividend came in. I noticed in my local car yesterday, they still had the, the word dividend there. Uh, it's uh, again a flashback uh, of all the dividend stamps. In the Second World War, the tea manufacturers had to share factories and there were tea allocations for high, medium and low blends. Now this was a problem for Lyons because they only had their high quality blends and they refused to compromise that. But they were in luck because their high quality tea went further and it did well. But even so, during World War II, its tea sales halved. In the early 1950s, um, Typhoon and Brook Bond, Brook Bond um, introduced branding with a vengeance. Again, Lion's Tea was in trouble. Uh, they didn't follow the same route. Um, Harry Salmon, he wanted to keep the links with the small retailers, the vans. In 54, Christopher Salmon, again, so we've got the Salmon link coming down, he joined the tea department. And he introduced quick brew and premium teas. But they didn't acquire Thai food. Again, they had that chance to acquire Thai food. Every time I'm on the continent, I see um, Thai food teas and I see Lipton's teas, and I think it could have been Lions. I could have been looking at Lions tea if these things had happened, but they didn't. There was a, a mismatch in processing between their wholesale approach and the van, the vans that Lion had. Lions had. By 1960, Lions had a 14 percent market share, Brook Bond 29% and Typhoon 18%. So if we think back, if they had merged with uh, Brook Bond, they would have had such a stronger, so much stronger position. By 64, the tea van sales ended because they were being undercut by wholesalers and they brought in new sales representatives with Ford Anglia estate cars 
working from home and covering various areas and with uh, visits to different types of retailers. So a completely different um, process. This was also computerised, um, but I'm not going to go into that today. So that's the background. Just have a quick drink. I think I might catch up on the time, actually. I hope I'm not um, whizzing these pictures past you too quickly and you're getting them. Okay. So, L4. It's my contention that it was very innovative in its treatment of large-scale stock control. Now, I'll read this um, quotation in full because it really, for me, uh, contains the kernel of what I want to say today about <coughs> T and Leo. Deeply implanted in the business that it served, the job maintained control on the thousands of chests of tea, classified for different flavours, colours, strengths, aromas and other characteristics, and followed them as they were mixed in prescribed proportions to produce the company's famous packeted blends. There were also the usual valuations to check that the permitted cost for each blend had been adhered to, and to arrive at the overall value of stock. Additionally, the computer application provided senior management with rapid information about stocks that had never been available before. Now, Dave and I actually go and teach uh, in France, and um, we teach as part of the Erasmus programme, and this is one of the things that uh, the French have heard about being a very British thing. And last time I, I went, I actually dug out part of Simmons's talk, and he really supports this idea very much of the management information system being very important for the tea. I must uh, dig that out and actually put it in the talk. So, L4, in October 54, it was providing background information. It was using tea that was in transit. So tea that was either still on its way in, on ships, what have you, or tea that was being weighed in the factories for tax purposes. It knew exactly where it was and was able to actually use that in their calculations because they knew that it would be there on time to use. They use the physical break number on each chest. So this is a very detailed program. It's not some, you know, um, theoretical program. This is a, a very, um, a very specific, very detailed actual program. It used the grades, the categories, and the subcategories of tea: the, the orange peaking, um, orange pico, all the various um, different categories of tea. And they used a pricing calculation with the current and the previous week's tea stocks with their various prices. And they could then value the schedule for each blend of tea. Now what's very important here is that you could amend those prices so that they could, um, they, they could predict what they were going to, to gain from their, from their tea stocks. They could, they could forward um, they could use the, the price levels of forward market conditions. So they were using this as a decision support system back in 54. Maybe it's the first instance of decision support for large stock control actually being used. Perhaps somebody here might know of one being used uh, in Angola before this. Perhaps you can tell me. You could use, the, they could then work out the forecast profit or loss per week on each blend. And the tea was blended one or two weeks before it was needed by the tea factory. And again, the blenders used the actual break numbers on the actual chests of tea. Now, what were we dealing with here? A mix of tea was about 20 chests, and the blend was 48 such mixes. And you had 500 mixings per week. I'm not going to stretch my arithmetic to work out exactly how much this is, but it was a lot. Um, and the L4 team would work very closely with the tea buying office um, to actually work out what was available and work out which break, uh, breaks were to be used. So the weekly tasks that were carried out on L4, and I was able to, to find the specification from um, 
don't give me a copy of this, and also there's material up at uh, the Manchester Archive, so I, I, I got a lot of material from that, so this is where this has come from. Um, they worked out the price for each subcategory and olive blend, and the olive blend is where you've got a, a mix already made, so you might have three or four blends that are the base of several blends like red label or green label, and that's your olive blend. There was a full stop statement, statement, profit and loss statement, and the weight and average price of stock from the London auction sales. The monthly tasks, they work out the, exactly how much tea they had in their warehouses for insurance purposes. Quarterly, a stock record depending on their physical chests, stock value, uh, valuations for accounting purposes, and then they could track anything that was moving very slowly. Um, so no longer the stock kind of hiding in the edges of the warehouse. And the tea office, as I say, was a customer. By May 1963, the area managers had their own tea sales records program to go with the, the four down the Euro states and the, the people selling in a different way. That again was all computerized. And to finish off, um, I've got, this is taken from Frank's article in the Annals, um, was it 2001, 2000? 2000, 2000, okay. Um, John Kay there talks about Lyon's innovation and reputation and architecture, attracting customers, how important it was to distribute and manufacture, how they responded so quickly to innovation. So not only in bringing in Leo, but, but in then using the Leo for this massive, massive operation. Their tea was in their, in their restaurants, in their corner shops, in their hotels, uh, and sold as a product by itself. So it's a massive part of Lyon's um, enterprise and how quickly the Leo was uh, applied to this, uh, to this area. Free sharing of information was very important to Lyon's development and how well they did, and the integration of innovation technology and their strategic assets. Reading through Peter Bird's material, uh, his, both his books on computing and Leo and, um, and also his uh, Food Empire book, he says by the 1950s, the loss of market in tea was due to um, adopting these high standards and not compromising um, these principles adopted by the management. Again, they promoted the red label rather than developed the quick infusion teas. And then they sold 18 blends without proper advertising. They just depended on the lion's reputation at a time when everybody else was um, marketing and their advertising. They didn't take over Typhoon with that wonderful 32% market share and also they didn't take uh, didn't merge with Brookbound in the north. And a lack of awareness of market research branding and said we know best. And Frank's analysis from this article, you talked a, a lot about the transaction costs, these these um, huge clerical costs and the importance of self-sufficiency. Oh no, this is, sorry, this is from your article. The other two were not from your article. Apologies, Frank. Uh, there's a, a John Kay's from elsewhere. From John Kay. Uh, this is your article. Uh, Goffey and Jones, um, Frank looked at um, the Goffey and Jones article, What Holds the Morning Company Together? And Frank applied this to the Lions situation and talked about the sociability and friendship and solidarity uh, in Lions and the communal culture and the synergy and learning um, in Lions and the long term view and the importance of that. So, Lions believed in their ability to produce high quality goods, particularly tea, in all market conditions, and they didn't want to lower their standards, whatever the difficulties. They declined to take the easy way out and take over Taifu or merge with Brookbond. Instead, it took the harder road of te technological innovation, using L4, Roland Leo, as possibly, I think I to say possibly, in K 
mechanism um, contradicted. Possibly the first example of a decision support system to keep their position in the tea market. <laughs>